grocery shopping or shopping online, it can be hard to pick the best material for you and also for the planet. There are just so many options out there and they all have their own nuances. And it boils down to so many different factors on like how many resources it uses, how many emissions it creates. Can it be recycled? Can it be composted? Can it be reused? Is it durable? There are so many different things to keep in mind. So let's discuss today these different factors when it comes to all these different single use materials and you can pick what's best for you personally. Of course, opting out of single use is always going to be the best option. If you can find package free or reusable packaging, that's great. But please don't go out there trying to like idolize any one of these single use materials. One might be better than the rest. Maybe a couple of them will be better than the rest, but at the end of the day, they are all single use. They all have to enter our imperfect recycling system. Hello everyone, it's Emma and welcome back to my channel where we talk about all sorts of things, zero waste, focusing on free, easy, and fun ways to live low waste and practical ways to be an activist. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. The first material we're gonna be talking about today is hard plastic. These are plastic things like plastic bottles, laundry jugs, plastics number one and two that are durable, rigid, can stand up on their own. And out of all the different types of plastic, hard plastics are typically the most recyclable. Plastic is made from oil. Yes, the same oil that gets turned into gasoline that we use to power our cars, if you didn't know. The oil is extracted, it is transported to refineries, turned into petroleum and other byproducts, sent to other facilities to be turned into plastic pellets, and then it's melted and molded into packaging. It's really quite a hefty process for something that we will only be using for a few moments and then throw away and it'll end up in the landfill forever, maybe recycled. Not to mention the extraction of the oil from the ground, that process is very pollutive and toxic. And if you wanna learn more in full about how plastic is made, the history of plastic, you can check out this video. All right, moving on to emissions from plastic. From our world and data, plastics create about 3.3% of emissions worldwide. That's total global emissions for the year. Here's another chart from the same website that shows how the emissions of plastic production keep going up. Since most plastic is made of, as a byproduct of oil, I wouldn't say that it takes up any more land than if we just stopped creating plastic. Like if we stopped creating plastic altogether, we would still be extracting oil to use in our cars, in our trucks, etc. The oil is being extracted anyway. It's just a byproduct of the, the oil refining process. While being very pollutive to create, I don't think this process is taking up any more land or resources in that way when it comes to creating plastic. So hard plastics are typically one of the most commonly accepted items for recycling in your curbside bins. And that's because it's quite easy to recycle. It's lightweight, it's not breakable, it's very commonly consumed. It's actually about 20% likely that a plastic number one will be recycled, which is pretty, pretty high but that's only the likelihood of it getting recycled. That's not actually its recycling rate. Among all plastic combined, this is including thin plastics, which we'll talk about in a minute, only about five to 9% of all plastic ever been created has ever been recycled. So it's hard to say what the true recycling rate of plastic number one is, but it's probably not a lot. And if it ends up in the environment, it will break down into microplastics. So microplastics are a huge problem. It gets into our water, our soil, and everything in between. So from start to end, plastic is one of the most pollutive things that we can create. Like literally extracting the oil from the ground is pollutive. The lack of recycling is pollutive. And if it ends up in the environment, it's terrible. The pros of plastic. It is widely accepted for recycling, though con, it's not always going to be recycled. More pros though, it's not breakable, it's lightweight, it can be reused, hard plastic, and it's actually pretty good at keeping food fresh for a long period of time. Cons, again, just because it is accepted for recycling doesn't mean it will be recycled. If it ends up in the environment, it will create everlasting pollution, it will never fully break down. Let's rate plastic. <laughs> Something I never thought I would say as an environmentalist. So emissions for plastic, I'm giving it a three out of 10. Keep in mind, these numbers are all my own opinions. They are arbitrary. Resource usage, I'm gonna give it a five out of 10 because it's kind of in the middle. Recyclability, two out of 10. The only thing worse <laughs> recyclability wise, I think is thin plastics. End of life, one out of 10 because it can't be recycled that often. So it does end up in the environment a lot of the times. And when it does end up in the environment, it is extremely harmful. Durability, I'm gonna give it a 10 out of 10. Never thought I'd rate plastic perfectly on anything, but like plastic is so durable. Reusability, five out of 10 because hard plastics, can be reused, yogurt containers, peanut butter containers, I've reused them before. That gives a total score for plastic a 26 out of 60. Okay, let's move on to thin plastics. These are plastics number three, four, six, and seven. And if all of those numbers are nonsense to you, you can check out this video up here where I break down all the different types of plastic. This is things like grocery bags, chip bags, styrofoam, red solo cups, plastic utensils, and things of that nature. Basically, they're so thin that recycling them really has no value. Yes, they are very easy to recycle, but a thin plastic bag is really only gonna melt down to something maybe that size, I don't know for sure. Because of how thin it is, it's not going to actually amount to much when you recycle it. Meaning it really takes more energy and money to melt it down and recycle it than it's worth. So how is it made? It's quite the same as hard plastics, 
oil is extracted, it's turned into petroleum and other byproducts, and then it's made into plastic. The only difference here is thin plastic is printed like into big sheets, big rolls of plastic, something like this. And then it can later be cut and molded into bags and stuff of that nature. For emissions and resources, Again, we already covered it with hard plastics. I put these into different categories because of their recyclability. For the most part, the emissions, the resources, the end of life is all pretty much the same as hard plastics. It's created the same. Thin plastics, their likelihood, only their likelihood of getting recycled is 5%. That's not how much actually gets recycled. So what happens? Once again, they end up in the landfill or the environment. There are other options like eco-bricking, downcycling, and so forth. And if it can be recycled, rarely is thin plastics going to be recycled in your curbside bin. Usually if it is recycled, you have to personally seek out a recycling center or, or a recycling drop-off. I'm sure you've seen these at the front of grocery stores. They accept thin plastics from grocery bags, bread bags, tortilla bags, etc. And then the end of life is quite the same as hard plastics as well. The only difference here is that because its recycling rates are even lower and the customers, the consumers have to actually seek out recycling if they want it to be recycled. I think there's more of a chance of this ending of the landfill than hard plastics. Pros, it's the lightest material of them all, making it, you know, the best for shipping. It's also easier to store malleable thin plastic. Like you can stack a bunch of bags on top of each other instead of trying to like Tetris a bunch of rigid packaging. And then it's also pretty good at keeping food fresh. But cons, rarely recycled and even if it is you personally have to seek out a place and do the work yourself once again if it ends up in the environment it's everlasting pollution it can be toxic to our health as well and for thin plastics particularly it's also very difficult to reuse like ratings once again for emissions three out of ten it's the same as hard plastics resource usage the same a five out of ten recyclability here it is one out of ten <laughs> this is the I believe the lowest recycling rate we will see in this video. So I had to give the lowest score. End of life, because of its low recycling rate and because it creates microplastics, one out of 10 for end of life, it's so bad. Durability, eight out of 10. I think thin plastics can be hard, can be easy to rip and tear, like actually at the grocery store and stuff like that. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty durable. Reusability though, a two out of 10. I think you can reuse some of it, but most of it's pretty difficult to reuse. And even if you can reuse it, it's probably only once or twice before it starts getting holes in it. And that gives us a total of 20 out of 60. I believe that's our worst score, but let's move on to bioplastics and see how they equate. How are bioplastics made? They are made from plants, hence the name bio. But these plants can either be byproducts like coconut husks, corn husks, etc., or it can be brand new food like corn and potatoes. I personally don't like the idea of growing food just for the purpose of it to be made into single use packaging that may or may not get composted. I think byproducts are the way to go, using food waste. The American Chemical Society says that bioplastics are made by converting the sugar present in plants into plastic. In the United States, that sugar mostly comes from corn. It makes bioplastics renewable and better for the environment than conventional plastics. I would say it is better in the sense that it creates fewer emissions because it's, it's less toxic to grow corn than it is to extract oil. But again, we're growing water intensive monocrops that are destroying biodiversity just to throw a single use item away. Okay. Okay, emissions, let's talk emissions. One metric ton of bioplastic creates about 0.8 metric tons of CO2 compared to 2.4 metric tons of CO2 to make one metric ton of oil-based plastic. That's a huge improvement in emissions, which I think is really good. But resource usage. So according to Statista, in 2022, the total agricultural land area that was used in the production of bioplastics amounted to approximately 0.8 million hectares. This is projected that this area will increase to almost 3 million hectares by 2027. That would account for approximately 0.058% of global agricultural area. This number is very low. It's not even 1% of what we use for global agriculture. But again, I think we should really be advancing technology to use byproducts to create bioplastics, corn husks, banana peels, apple cores, etc., versus growing new food to be turned into packaging. Because that's 3 million hectares of land that we could be using to grow food for ourselves. Because, as we'll see in just a moment, our composting in the United States is so poor that even if we use bioplastic packaging, it probably won't get composted anyway. Speaking of, let's move on to recyclability or compostability. Yes, bioplastics can be recycled. Some of them can. Big caveat, not all bioplastics can be recycled. They have to have the same plastic code as other plastics. Like I mentioned earlier, all those different numbers with the different types of plastics, that's what I mean here. If there's a bioplastic number one and a petroleum plastic number one, they can be recycled together because their components, their like biology essentially is the same. 
but that means the recycling rate is about the same. Hard, rigid bioplastics are only likely to be recycled up to 20% of the time, and thin bioplastics are only recycled around 5% of the time at best. But bioplastics can be composted too, which is good news, sort of. <laughs> Once again, this has many, many nuances to it. Most bioplastics are commercially compostable, not home compostable, but you do have to be careful about ingredients though. Some bioplastics are made from 100% plants, which is great. Some bioplastics are not made out of plants. How can they put bioplastic on it? I don't know. This makes this specific type of packaging, the plastic bioplastic combo, very difficult to recycle and probably shouldn't be composted because it has the potential to put microplastics in our compost. And as I keep saying, the main issue with composting bioplastics and relying on the compostability of bioplastics is that our composting systems in the US are just not there yet. Not everybody has access to commercial composting, and even if you do, some commercial composting don't take bioplastics. Recyclability and compostability for bioplastics really aren't great, but for me, it's not the end of the world because there's fewer emissions when it comes to creating oil-based plastics, which is great. As well as, if bioplastics, fully 100% plant-based bioplastics, end up in nature, it's not the end of the world. I'm not saying we should be littering them, but if it does accidentally happen, it will break down much faster than petroleum-based plastic, as well as there won't be anything left over. It will actually break down back into the earth and not microplastics. Pros. If it's made from food waste, this is a very, very low waste option, and I love that. It can be composted commercially and sometimes composted at home. Fewer emissions than traditional plastic, and it's not breakable. Cons though, not everybody has access to compost, let alone commercial curbside composting. It's so easy to greenwash with bioplastics. This is really why I hate bioplastics. I don't hate bioplastics themselves. I hate the companies that use bioplastics to greenwash us, which is all too often. Some can still contain petroleum-based plastic, which can lead to microplastics in our compost. It's sometimes not accepted for recycling, and when it's made from brand brand new food, it's valuable resources that we could be using in so many different ways other than throwing it away. Okay, let's rate bioplastics. First, emissions. I'm gonna give it a seven out of 10. Resource usage, a four out of 10. It's not using a ton of land space. I do think that land space could be used for better thing. Recyclability, compostability, three out of 10. Not great. I only give it a bump up above plastic because while its recyclability rates are the same, it has the potential to be composted. So end of life, three out of 10. Perhaps I could go a little bit higher with that. It might not be recycled or composted. It might be landfilled or end up in the environment. At least it won't leave microplastics for all eternity. And then for durability, I'm gonna give it an eight out of 10. Bioplastics are quite durable. I have found a couple bioplastics that just break really easy. Like we have some bioplastic dog poop bags they rip a lot. It's hit or miss with the durability. It might be really, really durable, so keep that in mind. For reusability, once again, three out of 10. There might be some that you can reuse, and that makes our total score a 29 out of 60. It's time to discuss metal. I think this is probably one of everybody's favorite materials. I personally love it, so let's dig into metal and see if it's all that it's cracked up to be. First, how is it made? So according to the Food Packaging Forum, food and beverage packaging made of aluminum consists of alloys of greater than 90% aluminum with other metals, such as copper, zinc, and manganese. Steel cans are produced from tin coated steel, also called tin plate, electrolytic chromium coated steel. Direct contact between the metal and the food can destroy the integrity of the packaging and change the properties of the food. Therefore, metal packaging is often coated with an organic polymer preventing these unwanted interactions. What does this organic polymer mean? I have no idea. I think usually it's plastic. It used to be BPA, which was terrible for our health. Thankfully, a lot of cans these days, most of them are BPA free, but the organic polymer makes me think that it might be bioplastic. I couldn't find a ton of information about this on the internet, so let me know. But unfortunately, this layer is necessary for cans because otherwise our soda, the acid from the tomatoes, etc., would just wear away at the metal. And I don't know if it would cause it to like fully corrode and fall apart, but it would affect the integrity of the can. So let's move on to emissions. This is where metal takes a big hit. So according to Reuters, it to create one metric ton of metal creates 11 metric tons of CO2. That's so much emissions. That's five times worse than plastic. But to be clear, that is creating raw metal from scratch, harvesting it from the ground, melting it down, etc. Thankfully, recycling metal reduces the emissions by 58% which is still 6.38 metric tons. It's not great. And also thankfully, most metal these days is recycled because it's so valuable, which we'll get to later. Moving on to resource usage, unfortunately, aluminum and steel are not renewable, so we will run out one day if we use it too fast. Speaking of recyclability, metals, particularly steel and aluminum, are extremely valuable and almost always accepted for recycling. In fact, I think metal recycling, like if I had to guess, metal recycling is probably the oldest form of recycling just because of how valuable metal is, as well as how difficult it is to make it from scratch. They're also even more valuable to recycle because they're infinitely recyclable. Let's just pretend this is a hunk of metal, just for the sake of this example. If I melt this down, it's going to be the exact same size when I recast it into something new. Plastic, if this was a hunk of plastic and I melted it down, 
I'd probably be only left with about half, which is why you could only recycle plastic like one, two, maybe three times. You can actually recycle in a lot of states and they will pay you to recycle. Look up your state, see if they'll pay you and not pay you to recycle curbside, but pay you to take your metal cans to a metal recycler. And for its recycling rate, according to Statista in 2021, around 70% of metal was recycled. And for the end of life of metal, since metal is widely accepted for recycling, the chances of it ending up in the landfill are statistically only 30%. But even if it does end up in the environment, it won't break down into any harmful chemicals. It will just break down eventually. It'll take a long, long time for metal to break down, but it eventually will break down and become part of the earth again. Pros to metal, it is infinitely recyclable and has really, really high recycling rates. It's also easily reusable in your own home. It's cost efficient for recyclers to recycle it and it can even make you some money as well. Now the cons, mining new metal is extremely harmful to the environment. Even recycling it is still very polluted due to the high energy that it takes. Let's rate metal. It's gonna get a one out of 10 for emissions. Resource usage, a five out of 10. I put this in the middle because while using brand new materials cre to create metal is really, really bad, the recyclability of it helps the resource usage over time. And speaking of recycling, the recyclability for metal, nine out of 10. Nothing is gonna be perfect, but I think this is about as close to perfect as we're gonna get with our current recycling system. End of life, it's gonna get a five out of 10 because it will take forever to break down in the environment, but eventually when it does, it won't leave anything harmful behind. Durability though, 10 out of 10. Metal is so durable. And like, even if it's dented, you can still use it. Reusability, seven out of 10. I don't think it's the most reusable. So that gives us a total score of 37 out of 60. Moving on to paper, paper package is really not all that common as a single use packaging because it can't hold liquids, it's breathable, so it's not the best at storing food for long periods of time, but it is quite common with things like pasta and mushrooms, as well as bags of the checkout line. So let's get into it. How is it made? Paper is made from trees. And if you didn't know as well, trees take decades to grow, meaning it takes decades of resource usage like water and fertilizer. There are other options to make paper such as bamboo as well. But for the sake of this video, we're going to be focusing on tree-based paper because that's the most common type of paper. So first, trees are cut down, they're chipped, and the chips are then turned into wood pulp. It is then washed to get rid of any dirt, residue, etc., and then bleached to make it the shiny white paper we all know and love. From there, it's, it's then sized to be turned into notebooks, printer paper, and other things like toilet paper, napkins, and so forth. But there's also so many different types of paper. Like that's like paper that we're going to be using as a consumer and not packaging. Packaging is typically unbleached and it's typically thicker things like a cereal box or corrugated cardboard like a package. Emissions, you would think with how long it would take trees to grow, it would create a lot of emissions, but no, Growing trees actually reverses emissions because they sequester carbon as they grow. For every one metric ton of paper that's created, it emits only around 15 to 63 kilograms of CO2. That's less than 0.1 metric ton of CO2. That makes the process of creating paper almost always around carbon neutral, even if companies aren't trying to be eco-friendly. But resource usage, this is the downside to paper. Not only does it take a lot of water, fertilizer, et cetera, for trees to grow, but it also takes a lot of room. And if you wanna know how much water it also takes to recycle paper, you can try recycling paper at home yourself. I did a video doing that a couple years ago during COVID. That was four years ago, dude. But according to the University of Illinois, it takes about 1.5 cups of water to create just one sheet of paper. That's a lot of water. So that makes 47 gallons of water per ream of printer paper to be exact. Paper is also one of the most commonly used items like in the world. Not just for packaging, we're also talking toilet paper, napkins, paper towels. So according to World Wildlife, this accounts for 13 to 15% of total wood consumption and uses between 33 and 40% of all industrial wood traded globally. And paper is still harvested unsustainably today. What does that mean? I thought trees were great. I thought they grew great. <laughs> What this means is they are planted in the form of monocrops, which destroy biodiversity, they destroy habitats. Of course, this isn't all the time. There are steps that can be taken to harvest trees more sustainably by being FSC for Stewardship Council certified, by planting native species and so forth. So this makes recycling even more important, but is recycling successful? In 2022, paper recycling rates were around 68% in the US, which is really good. Not to mention paper can also be composted, which I think is really, really great. Particularly things like dirty napkins that you use at the dining table that can't be recycled, chuck them in your compost. Now, should you recycle or should you compost paper? I think it depends. I think it's best to compost brown paper, stuff that's undyed, unbleached, stuff that might be dirty that you can't put in your comp in your recycling bin. I think it's best to recycle things like magazines, newspapers, things with dyes, bleaches, and so forth. So the end of life for paper. With recycling rates being that high and composting as a backup, I would say that paper has a pretty good end of life, especially because even if it does end up in the environment, 
it's not going to harm anybody. And in the long run, it won't leave anything harmful left. So the pros, it can be easily recycled and composted. It's very lightweight, can be reused, recycled, upcycled at home, and treats sequester carbon as they grow. Now for cons. It's not harvested in sustainable ways. It can cause deforestation and habitat loss. And it does take a lot of resources to grow a tree from scratch. Moving on to our rating. For emissions, I'm giving it a nine out of 10. I'm not sure you can get much better than trees sequestering carbon. Resource usage though, a six out of 10 because it does take a lot of water to create paper and it can lead to, you know, habitat loss. But recyclability, again, nine out of 10. End of life, nine out of 10, pretty high. Maybe, maybe that's being a little bit generous. Durability though, six out of 10, and that's probably very generous. Maybe we'll make that a five out of 10. Paper is really not that durable. It can tear so easily, it can rip easily. If it gets wet, it's basically ruined. So. Maybe I'll even make that like a three out of 10. And then reusability, a five out of 10. Not necessarily reusing it in the sense that like you're going to reuse that piece of paper as a piece of paper, but you can use that piece of paper as craft material. Anyway, that puts our grand total at 42 out of 60. All right, we're moving on to what people deem the holy grail maybe of materials in the eco world. And that, if you haven't guessed it yet, is glass. Everyone loves glass in the environmental movement, but why? Is it really that sustainable? Let's find out. How is it made? Glass is made from sand, limestone, and soda ash. Glass Alliance Europe says that it is made from natural and abundant raw materials. While it is natural, I would not say that it's abundant. Sand is a vital resource to many ecosystems and calling it abundant and just saying, you know, we can take as much as we want is really going to lead to habitat loss. As well as, I wouldn't say it's abundant because as we'll talk about later, it's a very specific type of sand. It's not just any sand that we can use. Not to mention the huge amounts of energy that we need to heat up the sand to melt sand and turn it into glass. According to Corning, the temperature required is actually 700 degrees Celsius 3,090 degrees Fahrenheit, which is approximately the same temperature a space shuttle reaches as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. Let's see how many emissions that creates. For one 500 milliliter bottle, that's half a liter, it creates about 503 grams of carbon dioxide. So that's about half of a kilogram, which isn't a lot, but that's per bottle. So according to Taylor and Francis online, 85 to 92% of the carbon footprint of glass is from the heating process to turn sand into glass. They found that recycling glass can reduce emissions by 37%, which means that, you know, there's still a lot of emissions when it comes to recycling glass as well, but it is cool that it is less. Sand is actually the second most used resource on the planet uh, and it comes in behind water. So we use about 50 billion tons of sand every year. This is actually leading to a sand shortage. So the sand can come from anywhere, including rivers, lakes, and oceans, but most of the time it has to be silica quartz sand. It means that there's actually not a ton of beaches to choose from. And that does mean that the silica quartz rich beaches are at highest risk for total destruction. Now for recyclability, according to the EPA, every year around 31% of glass gets recycled. And what goes to the landfill every year accounts for 5% of the total landfill waste for the year, which is over 7 million tons of glass. And this just goes to show you that recycling is not only important when it comes to reducing emissions and resources, but also when it comes to reducing landfill space, which we are running out of, by the way. You can learn more in this video. Why is glass not commonly recycled? Two main reasons. It's heavy and it's breakable. The heaviness of the glass means it takes a lot of energy to transport it. As for example, when we lived in Spokane, Washington, we were so far away from the closest glass recycler. I don't think Spokane had a glass recycler. I think the closest one was probably Seattle, meaning that glass had to be transported five hours away. But still, that's a lot of emissions to transport heavy glass. It's just not worth it. But also because it's breakable, it can be a hazard. If you didn't know, a lot of our waste is sorted manually. So broken glass can just be really dangerous to those who are sorting our waste. For the end of life of glass, many of us treat glass as single use and not reusable because glass is so easy to reuse. Not only us as consumers, but companies as well. I wish they would see glass as reusable instead of disposable. So the best thing that we can do when it comes to glass is reuse it ourselves at our own home, give it away to thrift stores, give it away to bulk stores, give it away on a buy nothing group on Facebook, find other ways to reuse it because yes, glass is recyclable, but it's not always accepted for recycling. So especially if glass is not accepted in your area, find other ways to reuse it. And even if it is recycled, it still takes a lot of energy to recycle it. Pros to glass, that's probably the easiest to reuse as well as it reduces energy when you recycle glass. Now the cons of glass, it is the most breakable and dangerous if it is broken. It can cause sand biome destruction and habitat loss due to the over usage of glass. It's very heavy, which increases emissions, not only in creation, but also for recycling. And because of all of this, it's not always accepted for recycling. For emissions, I'm getting it at a four out of of 10 resource usage a three out of 10 particularly because not a lot of glass is recycled a lot of it is made from brand new and creating brand new glass destroys habitats recyclability three out of ten 
not great. End of life, four out of 10. I think it's really great that glass is very, very easy to be reused and that it also won't create anything toxic in the environment, but its recycling rates are so low and it probably will never break down in the environment. So durability, five out of 10. I think if you're careful with glass, the durability is probably like an eight out of 10, but because glass is also so breakable, I had to just put it in the middle. And for reusability, 10 out of 10. I think glass is the easiest item to reuse. It lasts forever, it's non-toxic, but that puts our total for glass at a 29 out of 60. The last material that we're going to be talking about today is carton board or Tetra Pak. I made a full video about this that you can check out up here, but we're gonna talk about it in short for this video. So how is it made? Tetra Pak is 70% paper. The other 30% is paper and metal, making it a triple mix material. So it's made out of paper on the outside to reduce the amount of plastic packaging. The middle layer is aluminum to prevent light from getting in and keep the food lasting as long as possible. And then the interior layer is plastic to make it actually be able to hold liquids and stuff. So emissions, since it's 70% paper, 70% of its emissions comes from paper. And because paper emissions are so low, this greatly reduces the amount of emissions for the overall packaging. And this is why cartons are becoming so popular. It's because it's made a lot out of paper. So we're able to reduce our overall carbon footprint from this packaging without sacrificing the integrity of the packaging. It's still able to hold liquids and foods safely. But there are still some emissions from creating the plastic and metal. It's so for resource usage, I'm not going to dive into this too much because it is 70% paper. You can just reference the paper section that we talked about earlier. This is definitely one of those items that the recyclability is very high, but will it be accepted for recycling? Not always. I'm going to let the folks at Recycle More explain it better. Because of the multiple layers of the several types of materials, paper, plastic, aluminum, bound with adhesive, it makes these products difficult to recycle. Many recycling service providers do not have the capacity or the technology to properly sort these materials or the markets to sell them, which limits the recycling options. For facilities that do accept these types of cartons to be recycled, they will be separated by a certain process called hydropulping at the recycling facility. This process separates the paper layer from the aluminum foil and the outer plastic layers, and it is then recycled and reused for other purposes. So this means that the paper will actually she probably be recycled, but the plastic and aluminum probably won't. Rates in which it's becoming accepted for recycling are going up. For example, my mom's house got new recycling bins and now Tetra Pak is accepted for recycling here. Just last year in 2023, it was not accepted. And its recycling rate is around 20%, so not great, but I think it's going to go up in the future. Since it is a mixed material, it's hard to recycle cartons back into cartons. That's really what recycling is. Recycling is turning something back into itself. So rather, Tetra Pak is actually downcycled. Insulation, park benches, and so forth. It's better than the landfill, of course. Any new carton that's created isn't made from old cartons, it's made from new materials. And since it does contain parts of plastic, if it does end up in the environment, it can cause environmental harm and microplastics. Pros of Tetra Pak, it is lightweight, it is not breakable, and it does use less plastic, which is good. Cons is that it's still not that accepted for recycling, and because it's made from a lot of different materials, it can be quite resource intensive to create. For emissions, I'm gonna give it a five out of 10 because it's mostly made out of trees. I think that's really good, but clearly not perfect. Resource usage, a five out of 10 for the same reasons it's made out of paper, metal, and plastic. Recyclability, four out of 10. It's not the worst, it's not the best, but it is going up. So ask me again in a couple years. For the end of life, three out of 10, just because the recycling rates aren't great. And even if it is recycled, it's actually downcycled. Durability though, I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10. I think it's one of the most durable materials. But the reusability, I'm gonna give it a one out of 10. It's it's on the same level for me as thin plastics. That brings our total score to 27 out of 60. Here are our final scores. Once again, these are arbitrary. These are my opinions. You can read the facts above and make your own judgments based off of them. Paper at 45, metal at 37. That's a big gap. Bioplastic at 30, that surprised me. Glass at 29, Tetra Pak slash carton at 27, hard plastic at 26, and thin plastic at 20. Going into this post, I definitely thought that paper and metal were going to be at the top and I thought that plastics were gonna be at the bottom. Bioplastic surprised me coming in at number three and glass is about right where I'd put it as well, right smack dab in the middle. I hope that this video helps you to become a better consumer, a better recycler, a better reuser. Keep in mind that the reduce, reuse, recycle is in that order for a reason. Reduce what you consume, reuse it if you have to consume it and then recycle it as a last case scenario. Don't buy these materials thinking that Oh cool, the recyclable, my work here is done. Because recycling, as we can see from this video, is very, very broken. What you can do about that though, is actually support the recycling industry, buy recycled materials when possible, become better at recycling, follow your recycling rules. And if you wanna learn more about the importance of recycling, I have this video that you can check out down below. That is all that I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your time with this video, particularly because this one was very long, but very, very important. And thank you again, if you found any value in it, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with others who would find value in it. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, remember that your small actions make a big difference in the long run. Bye guys. I'm coming back on here for the bloopers because it was 105 minutes, an hour and five minutes. As I said, this is gonna be a long one. <laughs>
or electrolytic chromium coated steel. I can't believe I said that word without stuttering. Oh my gosh, my head hurts so bad. <laughs> We're dangerous to those who are sorting our trade. So 